the message. Jesus does what is best for us. Amen, church. Thanks um, to my kindergarten. All right, Jonathan, you may go. Our primary students, go. Go, Jaim. Go. Go. Go, Naomi. Go. Go, go. Primary, come, Anthony. The sun walk on the door that the in the world, the sun wants the dollar. The 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 world, Mama wears us so and everything to tell others what you have been doing to you. The message she said called up the message which shall we order as I wanted it shall we said amen lesson four Seeing is believing the message. I will tell others what Jesus has done for me. Memory verse. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. John 9, verse 25. Lost and found. The message, Jesus comes looking for me when I am far from him. The memory verse, our Father in heaven is willing that any of these little ones should be lost. Matthew 18, verse 14. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Lesson seven, safe in the storm. God cleanse my fear. Peace I leave with you, peace I give you. Do not be afraid. John 14, verse 27. Amen. Lesson nine, the bitter choice. The message, I thank Jesus for choosing to save me. Memory verse. Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. Luke 22, verse 42. Lesson 10, judging Jesus, the message, I thank Jesus for being willing to suffer for me. The memory verse, for he is pierced for our transgression and he... For he is, but by his wounds he, we are healed. Isaiah 53, verse 5. Lesson 12. He has risen. The, the memory verse. He is not here. He has risen. Luke 24, verse 6. Amen. Give a bigger amen to our primary students. Amen. All right, at this time, while they're leaving, we'll have our PowerPoint class.
Lesson one, yeah, family ties, power text. Yet yeah, to all who did receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. John 1, verse 12. Lesson two, spreading the good news. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release them from darkness for the prisoners. Isaiah 61 verse 1. Lesson 3. The Invisible Kingdom. In the same way, let your light shine that others may see the good deeds and, um, and glorify your Father in heaven. Matthew 5, verse 16. Lesson 4. <laughs> How good and pleasant is it when God's people live together in unity. Psalms 133, verse 1. Lesson 5, Midnight Friend in Galilee. Poor text. A friend loves at all times, and a mother is born at a time of adversity. Proverbs 17, verse 17. Lesson 6, Touching the Untouchable. Poor text. Prayers to Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort these in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. Two Corinthians. Second Corinthians. One verse three. Lesson seven, unlimited. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord, the Lord himself is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. Isaiah 12 verse two. Lesson eight. Tides use them or lose them. Power text. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in according with your faith. Romans 12, verse 6. Lesson 9, topic, service with a smile. Power text, the king will reply truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of man, you did for me. Matthew 25, verse 40. Lesson 10, topic, dead or asleep. PowerPoint, Jesus gives me peace when I face suffering and death. Power text, I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand on the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God. Job 19, verse 25 and 26. Lesson 11, Two Sad Sisters. Power text. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whosoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? John 11, verse 25 and 26. Lesson 12, topic a resurrection promise. PowerPoint. Jesus gives us new life today and for eternity. Power text. For the Lord himself shall come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. 
and the dead in Christ will rise first. First Thessalonians 4, verse 16. Let's give a hearty amen to all our PowerPointers. All right, at this time, we will have our real-time class. Lesson 1, Living as Heaven Citizen, the memory text. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. By this, all will know that you are my disciples. John 13, verse 34 to 35. Lesson 2, Holiness. Look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other one. Isaiah, Isaiah. Isaiah 45, verse 22. Lesson 3, living beyond ourselves. Risking everything for Jesus. Memory text. And the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a weakness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Matthew 24, verse 14. Lesson 4. Finding our place. A plea for help. Memory text. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. Psalms 133 verse 1. Lesson 5. Learning to stand. Memory text. And do not be conformed. And do not be conformed, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may be, that you may prove what is good and appreciable and perfect in the will of God. Romans 12, verse 6. Lesson 6. S substance and body abuses get a life finally brethren whatever things are true whatever things are noble whatever things are just whatever things are pure whatever things are lovely whatever things are good for report if there is any virtue and if there is any praiseworthy, and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on those things. Philippians 4, verse 8. Lesson 9, telling your story, amazing grace. Memory text, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing the Holy Spirit. Titus 3, verse 5. Let's attain spiritual gifts. Now you are the body of Christ and a member individually, and God has appointed these in church, first apostle, second, second prophet, third teacher after the miracle, then the, then the gift of healing, administrator, of tongues, first chronicles twelve verse twenty second to twenty eight. Lesson ten teens on a mission. Let no one aspire your youth, but be an example to the believers in the world, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. First Timothy 4, verse 12. Lesson 12, topic, relating to a local church, a fountain or a garden, memory text. 
but but you are a chosen generation, a, 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 a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own his own special pe people, that you that you proclaim praises the praises unto him who called you out of who called you out of dark out of darkness into his marvelous grace. First Peter two verse nine. Amen. Amen. Thank you to my real crime class. At this time, we are just going to have Pastor say something before we finish with our Cornerstone students. Put your hands, Put your hands together for the children once more. Amen. The word of God is always true. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's holy, but not depart from it. I just want to take this opportunity to commend the children department, the leaders, for the hard work that they have been doing. Amen, church? Amen. Amen. Let us continue to pray for and to encourage them in the Lord. Happy Sabbath, everybody. How are you this morning? You had a blessed week? Yes. Amen. Are you alive? Amen. So it's good to be in the house of the Lord. What do you say? Amen. Amen. I also want to take this opportunity to commend and to big up the youth's department. There is hope for greater Portmore. What do you say? Amen. Under the leadership of Brother Fabian. And in spite of the very challenges in his life, he still continued to give service to the Lord. And they did exceptionally well over the week. Put your hands together for the youth department. Let us continue to pray for and to support them. Also, I want to big up. I want to extort. I want to exhort. I want to commend a team of individuals at the Greater Portmore SDA Church. And that team is our leadership team. Amen, church? We have some solid leaders in Israel. Mind you, they are not perfect. But they have been doing their best for the Lord. The elders who are here, I'm going to invite you to stand. Where are you? Elders, and there might be some on the outside, and past and Elder Finnegan is not here. I just want to say to you guys, it's never easy to lead a church, and sometimes I might feel like giving up. But thanks be to God, you are still here. We just want to say thanks from the bottom of our hearts to you guys who have been guiding and leading and planning and executing. We'll continue to pray for you all that God will continue to strengthen and to use you in his service. This is thus verbally from our hearts. But in the future, we'll do something special for you guys. Bless up, big up, and may the Lord continue to bless you. Today is a special day in Zion. Very special day. Today we have the privilege, whatever we collect as it pertains to offering stays in the church. Amen. Amen. So I hope you bring your pocketbook and your wallet. Fabian, you have the ATM machine. We can get one so you can transfer. So I'm saying to you today, put out the very best as it pertains to offering for the Lord because the church needs it. And 100% today 
will stay in the church. This is wonderful. Amen, church? So let us do our very best for the Lord. Last but not least. Wanna know us on a special? Wanna have very special people, you know? The way you are special. We have a special man with a special group. He's no other than Pastor Dr. Courtney Dukey. He is here for about a week or so on vacation. But because he's a man of God, you are the only person who gets him on a Sabbath. Amen. Through my wife. My wife is very forceful, you know. So you know it goes. So I'm happy to have them. And he is here to share with you. And him carry the whole Jack Mandor family with him. Bless the name of the Lord. Some wonderful people. So I hope that you'll be blessed. Take good care of him as he'll be taking care of you. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful Sabbath. And God bless you. Thank you, sis. Thank you. No problem, Pastor. Um, we'll finish off with our Cornerstone students. Lesson one, the way of two worlds, key text. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angel, but they were not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The ancient serpent, known as Satan or the devil, was cast down to earth with his angels with him. Revelation 12, verse 7 to 9. Lesson two, laws meets love. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord as he was walking through the garden, but they hid from him. The Lord called out, saying, Where are you? Genesis 2, verse 8 and 9. Lesson 3, topic, out of control, key text. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why that skull on your face? If you have done the right thing, you would be smiling. But because you have done evil, sin is crouching at your door. It wants to rule you, but you must overcome it. Genesis 4, verse 6 and 7. Lesson 3, topic, a very long walk with God. Key text. Then Enoch, when Enoch was lived 65 years, he became the son of Methuselah, the father of Methuselah. Lesson 3, topic, a very long walk with God. Key text. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he became the father of Methuselah. After he became the father of Methuselah, he walked faith faithfully with God 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, he had lived 365 years. Enoch walked faithfully with God, then he was no more because God took him away. Genesis 5, verses 21 to 24. Lesson 5, topic. Lesson 5, topic, Noah's Way, key text. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth. And with every inclination, inclination thought of the human heart was only evil. Was only evil. All the time. But Noah 
But now I've found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Genesis five, 6, verses 5 to 8. Lesson 6. Reaching towards heaven. Key text. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heaven, so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered across the face of the earth. Genesis 11, verses 4. Lesson 7, topic, long, strange journey. Key text, and I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. Genesis 12, verses 2. Lesson 7, topic, God provides. Key text, do not lay a hand on the boy, he said, and do not do anything to him, for now you have proved that you fear God, in that you have not withheld anything, even your own son. Genesis 22, verses 12. Lesson 9, no laughing matter, key text. So Lot went and spoke to his sons-in-law, who were pledged to marry his daughters, and he said, Hurry and get out of this place, because the Lord is about to destroy the city. But his sons-in-law thought he was joking. Genesis 19, verse 14. Let's return. Win some and then some. Key text. After she had given him a drink, she said, I'll draw water for your camels too until they have had enough to drink. Genesis 24, verse 19. Get a bigger amen to all our children, brethren. It's never easy to come up and say, repeat um, from memory when persons are looking at you, especially if you are not used to it. I know our adults have gotten a break from coming up. So starting next quarter, we are starting back with our adults, um, class one, then class two, class three, so I don't have to remind any of the adults to study their lessons. All right? So another big amen to all our children today. And I hope that we will continue to support them. If you realize as they get older, they don't want to come in and say anything anymore. So I'm asking you to pray for them, to support them, and let them know that we love them, not chastise them, but love them. All right? Have a wonderful Sabbath. At this time, we usually collect an offering for building of the temple. So we'll ask the ushers to come in their places. Ushers, please. We sing Billion of the Temple. Bring. Billion of the Temple. Billion of the Temple of the Lord. Billion of the Temple. Billion of the Temple. Billion of the Temple of the Lord. Let's want to help us. Sisters want to help. want to help building up the temple of the Lord building up the temple building up the temple building up the temple of the Lord building up the temple building up the temple of the Lord one more time building up the temple building up the temple building up the temple of the lord building up the temple 
Building of the temple, building of the temple of the Lord. Let us close our eyes while we pray for the building of the temple fund. Father in heaven, we thank thee for life, we thank thee for food, clothing, and shelter. We thank thee for the funds which has provided for help to build up thy temple. We pray we bless it, help that you use wisely. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All those who are taking part in divine service, could you meet on the outside, please? Happy Sabbath, church. Please permit me a few minutes to do some housekeeping matters. We have two transfers um, here today. This is the first reading for the transfer of membership into the Greater Portmore Church for Sister Eulene McQueen, coming from the Comfort Castle SDA Church. The other one is, this is the first reading for the transfer of membership into the Greater Portmore Church for Brother Winston McKenzie, who is coming from the Mandeville Church. We'll have the second reading next week. Thank you. Happy Sabbath, everyone. All right, I hope that you are doing well today. Please listen to the following announcements. The Hellshire District of Churches prayer meeting for Tuesday, March 28th will be at 5 a.m. and this will be on Zoom. Rally of the last names that began on February 4th. Uh, the team leaders, Sister Narika Bennett, she is in charge of persons with last names uh, A to E, Sister Vivian, Vivian Henry, F to J, Sister Shanice McCallow, K to O, Elder Fermin Parkinson, P to T, Elder Ewan Williams, U to Z. Uh, the rally will culminate on April 28th with our harvest and Thanksgiving service. And church, I cannot tell you how important this is for us to raise as much funds as we can because we know that we do have our expenses and of course we do need our own building, all right? Our Sunday and Wednesday evening services continue this week. Good News Sunday is online and that begins at 7.15 p.m. While on Wednesday, prayer and praise is face to face and that meeting begins at 7.30. Please join us each week in praise and worship. The women's ministry is inviting all men to join our congregation to join the women this week, Tuesday, March 28th, for a special edition of Sip and Study, as we will be talking about self-esteem and self-worth. And of course, our speaker, presenter, will be none other than Sister Shernet Rowe, all right? So men, please join our women this week for Sip and Study, as we will be talking about self-esteem and self-worth. And I sh I'm sure you will enjoy it. Bible class is at 3 p.m. And AY at 4.30. Vesper at 6.19. Uh, infant dedication is every first Sabbath. So if you do have an infant to be dedicated or you do know of one, this will be every first Sabbath. Our virtual prayer room Thursday, March 30, 2023, is at 10 p.m., and this is via Zoom. From the pastor's desk, Pastor Richards will be in vestry. For this week, it will be Wednesday, all right? So it's not Tuesday. For, the, for next week, it will be on Wednesday from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m., or you could reach him at 876-883-5332. The church choir meets every Sabbath immediately following divine worship and on Thursdays at 7 p.m. Pathfinder Campari 2023 will be held 
from April 4 to 8, the church will be sponsoring three children this event. Health, the health department will be conducting blood sugar and blood pressure checks every Saturday evening immediately following Vespers. A minimal contribution will be required to offset the cost, and you could speak with Sister Sonia Johnson for further details. On to our death announcement, Sister Lloyd's father has passed. The funeral service will be held on Sunday, April 2 at 8.30 a.m., and further details will follow. Also, Sister Valerie Da Costa, is she here? Oh, she, she's not here? Okay, she will be leaving the island on Wednesday of next week, and she is asking us for prayer, all right? Mm -hmm. And finally, birthday greetings. So we do have one, Sister Paulette Banton, on March 28th. I do hope that you will have a wonderful day when it comes and greetings is coming from the entire church family. All right? Do have yourself a wonderful day. When people make claims about religious or cultural exclusivity, things can get kind of ugly. So when a group claims to be God's chosen ones, it's really easy to feel skeptical. What then does the Bible say about the church that's supposed to make it fundamentally different than this exclusivist attitude? That's what this video is all about. What does it mean to be chosen by God? Many people know that the Bible speaks about Israel as God's chosen people. This is one of the main themes of the Old Testament. And even in the New Testament, Paul said that the gospel would be preached to Jewish people first, but also to Gentiles. So what does it mean to be chosen by God? The ancestral forefather of the Jewish people was a man named Abraham. Abraham was chosen by God to begin a great nation, and God promised that through Abraham's descendants, all peoples of the world would be blessed. Jesus fulfilled God's promise to Abraham by fulfilling God's law and dying for the forgiveness of all people's sins. He opened the way for non-Jewish people to join God's family. Abraham was chosen to have the special honor of being father to a great nation. Jesus also specifically chose Paul to be a messenger. Even though Paul was Jewish, like Jesus, he was chosen to preach the gospel to the Gentiles and to bring them into the kingdom of God. That was a mission that Paul was proud to fulfill, but there was also a sadness that came with this mission. In Romans 9, Paul says, My heart is filled with bitter sorrow and unending grief for my Jewish brothers and sisters. I would be willing to be forever cursed, cut off from Christ, if that would save them. Paul was brokenhearted because his own people, in many cases, would not believe in Jesus and receive the blessing that God had promised to Abraham so long ago. Paul explained that God's true people consisted of anyone who trusted Jesus Christ with the same kind of faith Abraham had thousands of years before. Jew or Gentile, anyone could accept Christ and be God's chosen. Are there some special chosen people who God prefers? No. The door is open to everyone. The church is the collective chosen family of God, the new Israel, the new children of Abraham. All people are welcome to join this chosen family if they accept Jesus Christ as their savior. God did not predestine some to be saved and others to be lost, but instead welcomes anyone to a new destiny in Christ. This fulfills his promise to Abraham a family as big as the whole world. Jesus has opened the door for you to join the family too. Everyone is welcome in the family of the Chosen One.
May the deacons please come forward to collect the morning's tithe and offering. Father in heaven, you said, Behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me. But what will our reward be if we rob God? Please, even now, as you have blessed us, so may we be a blessing. And may we show our loyalty as the lady with the two mites. Which I pray through Jesus' name. Amen. Often, the jar of flour will not be used up, and the jug of oil will not run dry until. Day and night, months and seasons, seeding and harvesting are cycles created by a God who is himself regular and dependable. The story of the Zarephath widow's oil and flour testifies loudly about the God whose compassions never fail and are new every morning. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, told her the prophet, the jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day of the Lord sends rain on the land. Every single day during these three and a half years of famine, there was food on her table. She never missed a single meal. God faithfully kept his promise in response to the widow's action to provide first for Elijah, the man of God. During these days of scarcity, God's miracle was as consistent as dawn. But God remains consistent even today. 
There was a family that had recently settled in a new country and encountered some financial challenges. Their family budget was not balancing, so they decided to remove all superfluous expenses. But that wasn't enough. It was now time for some drastic decisions. Temporarily cut their giving to God through the church or not enroll their son in his piano classes. Prayerfully but painfully, they chose to put God first, which would mean no piano lessons for their son. A few days later, early in the morning, the wife picked up an envelope from their living room floor. The envelope was sealed and had no name written on it. When she opened the envelope, she couldn't believe it. There's money inside, she said. The amount was more than enough to cover the fee for piano lessons for at least three months. It was at this exact moment that the family experienced the consistency of God's care. While some life circumstances may tempt us to interrupt our regularity in worshiping God with our resources, God expects us to trust Him by worshiping Him with our tithes and promise as regularly as He blesses us with an income or increase. The wise Solomon said, Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase, so your barns will be filled with plenty and your vat will overflow with new wine. Allow God's faithfulness and regularity to inspire you as you worship Him with your tithe and promise. May we put our desires last and God first. be seated. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Are you happy to be here today? Yes. Let me hear you say, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When I think of the goodness of Jesus and what he has done for me, my soul cries out, hallelujah. Praise God for saving me. Let us sing that little chorus, brethren. When I think of the goodness of Jesus and what he has done for me, my soul cries out, hallelujah, praise God for saving me. One more time. When I think of the goodness Jesus' blood and righteousness. 
Number 522. Two. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness seems to fill his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. a foretaste of glory divine. Number 462. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of Born of the Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story. This is my song. This is my song. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long.
much. Thank you. Let's stand for the opening hymn. Please stand. Number 100. Very often I get this opportunity to greet my brothers and sisters. I want to thank Elder Hansen for this opportunity. He had tried on previous occasion, but the devil intervened somehow. But he was thoroughly defeated yesterday. What happened when I was at work? The system went down. Check the CPU, there was no light or anything. Started panicking. When we check about something to five o'clock, realized the power supply had gone. 
and there was only one place in Old Harbor that we could get that power supply, and they was closing at about in the next two minutes. We called them, and the distance that we were from Old Harbor, they said, we won't catch them. But somehow somebody came on the phone and said, okay, we'll wait until you come, and you'll get the battery. Because if I didn't get the battery, I have to wait for somebody from New Kingston to leave at 5 o'clock to come, and I wouldn't get the opportunity that I'm getting now. Okay. The scripture reading is taken today from 1 Corinthians 3, 16 to 17. Know he not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. If any man defile the temple of, of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is the holy temple, E-R. It's here in the it's a reading. No, dear Lord, as we pray. going to be interceding on behalf of all of us and as I pray I pray that you will pray for me in the meantime let us pray a wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord a wonderful Savior to me he hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock and covers me there with his hand for this morning, oh God, we just want to give you thanks for sparing our lives to see another day. We thank you for taking us to church safe and sound and for clothing us in our right mind. As we come into your presence, Lord, we are asking you to empty us of everything that is unlike thee. All the cares that we have during the course of the week, all the concerns and everything that bothers us. As we are in your presence, we are asking you to empty us of them so that we will receive the blessing that we come in search of. It is not no coincidence why we are here this morning, because we know that you are the living God and you are worthy to be praised. And so we come just as we are, empty, broken. And so we are asking you to fill us with your love. Many of us come this morning with so much baggage, you know, the things that bothers us. But we're asking you to help us to leave them as we come to the foot of the cross. We're asking you in a very special way to search our faces. Just as our faces are different, so are our needs. We come, some of them we can verbalize, some of them we can't. We clutch them to our hearts and we tell nobody. But of course, we can tell you. So we're asking you this morning to help us to remember that we, are, we don't need any intercessors for us to tell you the things that bothers us. We're asking you to remind us of where you have brought us from and where we could have been. This morning, Lord, we pray for the speaker. He has traveled from far. You know the distance from which he came. And we're asking you to take a life call from off the altar and to touch his lips anoint him from the crown of his head to the sole of his feet and as you present your words to us help us that our hearts will be filled with love and compassion and glory for thee and as we draw close to the end of time 
I pray that none of us represented here from different homes or family with us will be in that number when the saints go marching in. Thank you, Lord, for hearing. Thank you for answering. We pray and ask these mercies through your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Hear our prayers, O Lord. Hear our prayers, O Lord. Incline thine ears to us and grant us thy peace. Amen, church. Amen. Sitting in the speaker's chair this morning is an international speaker, one who is blazing the trail away in Canada and is here on holiday. When I asked Pastor Courtney, Doc, Pastor Dr. Courtney Doctor, I don't know if I pronounced that right, what should I say about you this morning? He told me that just call my name. So I'm not going to disobey him. I just call, I don't even know if I call his name right. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> but he has traveled all the way and he has an army of soldiers with him this morning. I'm not going to ask you to stand again. Just raise your hand, let the bridging recognize it. All those travel visitors with Pastor. Okay, amen? Okay. Let us. Pray a silent prayer so that the Lord will be with the pastor so that after we left here, we'll say it was good for us to be here. Amen. Just before pastor comes in, Sister Baker will come to us with a meditation song.
Happy Sabbath, church. It is good to be in the house of the Lord. Is it Nordica? Did I get that correct? The young lady that sung Sister Russell. Baker. There we go. I was reading the program, so guess what? Thank you so much, Sister Baker, for those two songs. I was blessed. Thank you so much. It is good. It is good. Can we get this down a little bit? It is good to be in the presence of the Lord. I am really happy today. Um, not because I'm preaching, not because I'm in Jamaica. I'm happy for that too. But I'm happy that uh, my family is here, my wife. Uh, seated over there, and my two children, uh, my wife's mother, a friend of my wife, friend of my home church in Canada is here with us, but I'm also happy that two of my brothers are here with me today. I think they stepped outside, and one of my brother's wife is there, and it's a blessing to have them in church today. It is a blessing, and I hope and pray that as we go through this time, that God will speak to our hearts. In the last six months, or probably more so three months, I've been asking myself a few questions. You know, one of the things about God and His holiness is what is it that God desire for us? What is it that God hopes for his people to be? And how do we become or be what God desire for us to be? You've heard the scripture reading, and I'll read it one more time for you. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, it reads, Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. A quick Google search of what this text means, and I say Google, everything you read will tell you that you need to exercise, you need to eat healthy, Everything, you, most of what you'll find on Google will tell you that you must do something about your physical body. You must do something to strengthen your body. Are you going to exercise? Are you going to um, eat healthy? Whatever you do, but every study, everything you'll see, uh, at least on the first three, four pages of Google, has to do with my body. Just exercise on what I eat healthy, do all these things. One of the things about this text that uh, we're going to spend some time with it today is to look at it more so from the background in my mind, from the background of Paul's mind. So we're going to try to spend a few minutes to get into Paul's mind. So we're going to take the text from the printed pages. And we're going to try to go all the way back some 2,000 years ago. And we're going to try to get into Paul's mind and try to figure out what was going on there. But before I do that, bow your heads with me. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for your love and your mercy. We thank you for your compassion and your grace towards us. And Heavenly Father, as we spend these moments together, I pray that your spirit will live and move and exist within us. Father, we thank you. For your grace 
And Lord, I pray that you will anoint my lips. Speak to me and through me. And Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, we pray in Christ's name. Amen and amen. Imagine with me for a moment. Bring to your mind the brightest light, the brightest glory that you've ever seen in your life. If you've meditated before on the word of God and you, you try to encapsulate your mind with God's glory, just go there and try to imagine. If you can't imagine it, just think of the sun on the outside. It is approximately 150 a million miles away. It shines, and most of us will have a light bulb in our house. A regular light bulb is between 50, 80, and 90 watts. And you think of the sun, as you look at it, the sun is probably about 3.85 times 10 to the 30 power. That's a lot of zeros behind that. Watts. That's how bright the sun is. Imagine that bright light. I'm not you can see it on the outside. Uh, picture that in your mind and keep your mind there. And you're also going with me to at least Genesis. And you're seeing Adam and Eve as they came from the Creator's hand. And you recall that it wasn't until sin they recognized that they were what? They were naked. Somehow, I want you to start to imagine with me that Adam and Eve is covered. They are covered in God's glory. And I want you to sort of picture with me what that glory looks like. And you're going to keep that picture in your mind. As I go through this, you're going to keep that picture in your mind that here are these two beings, and they're wrapped up in God's glory, and uh, we, we can protrude our minds there, and, and we can say they're covered with God's glory, and when you look at them, you're seeing the glory of God. And if you want to understand the glory of God, remember Moses, when he went up into the mountain, and he had a conversation with God, and he came back down, and when he came down, no one could look at him, because he has a dim version of the glory of God. And, and with that dim version, he had to veil his face. And this was a glory that will fade eventually. Think of Adam and Eve and, and think of them that they lived in that glory of God. You can keep your mind there. Really want your mind to be focused, to be centered on God's presence and his glory. Because there is something I think, something I know, that God desires for his people that we have not tapped into yet. And God desires for us to tap into it. So that's Adam, that's Moses. And then we, we think about the, this magnificent light, this glory of God, the holiness of God. So think moving from... Genesis to Exodus, something happened. Genesis 15, uh, God predicted that they will go into Egyptian captivity. They will get out of Egyptian captivity. They, God sent Moses to deliver them. And now they're out of captivity. They're going through the wilderness. And God wants to establish, reestablish something with them. And in Exodus, it says that let them do what? Let them build me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. So God desired to dwell among his people. He said, let them build me. I want to reconnect with them. I have not connected this way with them for over 400 years. I want to reconnect with them in a special way. So God said, let them build me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. So the theme of God is that God wants to dwell with us, within us. God wants to be there with us. And the Bible says once they've established this temple, they've built this temple. And most of us, 
We know the temple system. We know that there's two compartments. There's holy, there's most holy. There's all of this priest doing the work. And keep that in mind too. That you have the priests and they're doing daily service. They're doing yearly service. Just keep that in mind. Not just a theory of that. Not just a recollection of that. That historically we've had this experience. That they, the Israelites had this experience. Keep that also in your mind. Throughout the book of Leviticus. Probably at least 15 times in Leviticus. God says this to them. Look, I am holy. And those who, who are called to be with me needs to be holy as well. And, and this is always a captivating thing for my mind. Because I cannot conceive what God's holiness is. But yet still God is saying I need to be as holy as him. My myopic mind cannot conceive what that holiness is. But yet still God is saying, I need to be like him. That's a very challenging thing for us to think about. Again, I want to keep your mind there. This is what God is calling us into something. It says, I am holy, therefore you need to be holy. Let them build me a sanctuary that I may dwell amongst them. The word temple... Simple means where God lives. So in the Hebrew, the word temple means simple where God lives. So in other words, when they built the sanctuary, you remember God was with them with a pillar of fire by? Come on, are you going to help me here? When they built the temple, God was with them with a pillar of fire by? And what? There we go. At least we know we're reading Exodus. It is getting to this place where God starts to walk with them. God starts to move with them. And forgive me if I walk out of your camera. You, you tell me if I'm in a good place. God wants to dwell among them. God wants to be with them. In Exodus chapter 20, rather chapter 40, it says that God's glory reside in the temple. Where God's glory reside? In the temple. Again, keep your mind there. Because God's glory is in the temple. God is perfect. God is holy. God is righteous. God's desire is for his people to get to that place. For his people to be that. Because his glory fills the temple. Again, in Ezekiel chapter 43, Ezekiel 43 says that God's glory, God's magnificence, it captivates the temple. So now picture the temple, and as you picture the temple, you're picturing God's glory in that temple. Are you still there with me? Your mind is still there? That God's glory is in the temple. Again, if you walk through... Genesis and you get through Exodus and you go through Leviticus over 20 times God says I am holy and you need to be holy and we come all the way through and we're in Chronicles many kings have passed at least we're up to Solomon Solomon is rebuilding the temple and the day of Solomon's dedication of the temple if you remember that day when Solomon dedicated the temple he brought the entire Israelite together and, and while they were there, uh, Solomon killed uh, uh, hundreds, thousands of animal sacrifice to dedicate the temple. And, and the Bible tells us that at the end of the day, this is Solomon rebuilding the temple now. At the end of the day, the glory of God came down in that place. So notice I want you to track with me. Throughout history, if we go, we're in Chronicles. If you go through Judges, God's people are always what? Up and down, up and down. They are 40 years here, 30 years here. They are with God, not with God. They're doing all manner of things. But yet still, when God came back and when Solomon dedicated the temple, we see that God came back in his temple well the reality is i want you to know god never leaves this temple but people start to do different things so again keep your mind there where we've seen adam and eve clothed in god's glory they have sinned they lost the glory of god many things happened they went off into captivity now they're out of captivity god says let them build me a sanctuary that i may dwell among them god's glory is moving with them the bible tells us numerous times that god's presence his glory is in the temple Sometimes we do things to God's temple. 
I'm only going to share one. You, if you go through your Bible, you'll read numerous times where kings and leaders do things in the temple of God that were not appropriate. One such is a famous guy named Manasseh. And if you remember what Manasseh did, he corrupted God's temple in such a way that he built altars to numerous gods in the temple. Manasseh decided that I care nothing about God. I'm going to create my own God. And the Bible says, if you ever have your Bible, go there to 2 Chronicles. And you can read the chapter, chapter 33. It tells us in verse 4 that Manasseh, he built altars in the temple of the Lord. Can you imagine the audacity of Manasseh in that same holy temple that God's presence came down in? Manasseh is now building an altar to Baal. It says that in, in, in verse 4, he built an altar in the temple of the Lord, of which the Lord had said, my name will remain in Jerusalem forever. Verse 5, in both courts of the temple. So again, you're picturing this in both the holy place and the most holy place of the temple, Manasseh is building images to false gods. The question is, what are the images in our temple? What are the things that are in our temple? Remember, the word temple from Hebrew means the place where God lives. Still with me, right? The word temple means a place where God lives. And if God does something, and this might challenge us a little bit. If God does something, whatever God does never change. And so if God lives inside of you, he doesn't get up one day and leave because you're doing something to mess up. Keep that with me. Okay, let me say that again. If God says something, not because of your actions... God is going to decide to change his mind. So if God says, I live in my temple, even if you're messing up the temple, it doesn't mean that God gets up and says, I'm leaving the temple. Because God never changes. And sometimes we have these thoughts that if I am in such a messy state, in my messy state, God is not there with me. When I messed up, God looks for a way to to excuse himself from my life because somehow I have messed up and God cannot live with my mess. God doesn't condone our messes. But God doesn't leave us when we are in our messes. He doesn't condone it, but he doesn't leave us when we are in it. And so we're seeing Manasseh did this. And the question for us today, what are things we're doing to God's glory in our temple? I'm not there yet. I'm just giving you an idea where I'm going with this. So Manasseh messed it up. So let them build me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 19 and 20. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 19 and 20, it says this. Or do you not know that your body is what? The temple of who? The Holy Spirit within you. Whom you have from who? From God. You are not your own. You're not what? You're not your own, for you were bought with a price... So glorify God in your body. So we're getting closer to this thing where we're seeing the, the word glory. We're seeing we are what? The temple of God. We are still imagining what the, the brightness of that glory looks like. We have seen Moses having an experience like this where the glory of God is still on Moses. And no one could look at him. Saints, I'm bringing you somewhere because I really desire us to see what God intends for us. There is so much more that God intends for us than we are doing today. I love what Paul says in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1 and 2. Paul says, I beg you, I beseech you, I implore you. I, I, I'm, I'm craving your attention by the mercies of God 
present your what? Your body's a living sacrifice. So here Paul is using an in interesting language. Paul is using the language of the sanctuary and he's saying, present your bodies. A living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable? Which is your reasonable service. So now we have seen a physical temple. We have seen what the physical temple looks like. You have studied that before. You have digged into it. You, you've spent, our church has spent so many times studying the sanctuary system. So I guarantee you every single person here at least, you know the sanctuary system. You know the glory of God. How does that become practical for us? I know we can debate the points around the sanctuary, what the colors mean what the compartment means, what the symbols in there mean. I know we can debate what they mean or we can find a text throughout the Bible to defend and, and debate our points and we can win an effective argument in bringing texts and sources and all these things. We can win the argument about what the sanctuary is, but the point is what does it mean for you and I living some 4,000, 5,000 years away from that point in history. What does it mean to us today? Is it just an archaic historical document that we put aside and say, thank you, Lord, for helping me to understand that there's a point in our history when we have this sanctuary thing and now we're in a new age and this is what we're doing? What's the practical sense? What does that mean for you and I today? The Bible tells us that now we have, we are a sanctuary and that God dwells in us. And God is going to build us, listen to this, listen to this. First Peter chapter 2 verse 5, first, first Peter chapter 2 verse 5 says this. As you come to him, who is the him here? As we come to Christ, as we come to have a relationship with Christ, God said this, the Bible says this, Peter says this. Uh, when we come to Christ, we become a living stone. Rejected by humans, but chosen by God, precious to him. You also, you, who are the you? So we talk about Christ is a living stone. And it says, you also are living stones. Being built into a what? A spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For the scripture says, see, I lay in Zion is as in Zion a chosen and precious cornerstone and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame but now verse 7 now to you who believe this stone is precious but to those who do not believe the stone has become a stumbling a rejected and a cornerstone point is follow me Jesus is a living stone it says that we are also living stones. And we're being built into a spiritual house. What are we built into? A what? I only hear this side. What are we built into? A spiritual house. And notice the language there. It says you're being built into a spiritual house. And you are now what? You're priests. Of that spiritual house you are going to offer sacrifice in that spiritual house so in other words if you follow me so far we've transitioned from a physical temple we've transitioned from this thing where you are you see this old system and now you're seeing you and die and we are now this spiritual house it's not this building we're in it's not any building that we've been into but we have seen now we're the spiritual house Honestly, this is deep. You know why? Because if we sort of conceive ourselves as being spiritual house, this world will change immediately. I, I don't, I'm not debating that one. If we start to conceive the picture the Bible is painting, if we sort of conceive this, this world will transform overnight. We are the spiritual house. We've been built into this thing. And God has something special in store for us. Who started this thing? Well, Jesus did. Not, I'm not the one who did it. Jesus said to the people around him, look, 
you destroy this temple and are rebuilding what? And what, he was, what was he referring to? Himself, right? So he said, if you destroy, so Jesus started this. He referred to himself as the temple and he says, you kill me, I'm going to be back in three days. It wasn't Paul that started it. Jesus started. Jesus said, look, you destroy this temple, and, I build it. and they're like, oh, come on, Jesus. You're crazy. Wow, you're crazy. It took us 490 years to build this thing. So Jesus is on the spiritual, and they're on the what? The physical. Jesus is calling them into a spiritual thing, and don't misunderstand the word spiritual as anything else apart from what we're referring to in the scripture. Uh, sometimes I use words and people critique it. Uh, when I say spiritual, I'm not referring to any Eastern tradition. I'm not referring to modern way of understanding spirituality. I I'm talking about the division within the mind that we, we have to transition from being this physical thing where we start to perceive things more spiritual. We got to allow our minds to get into the spiritual realm to understand what God desires for us. So Jesus said, look, if you destroy this temple, in three days I'll build it back. So what does this mean? Revelation 3.20. Revelation 3.20 says this. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. This is fascinating because I, 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 this verse is one of the hardest verses in the Bible to understand, at least in my mind. Because the owner of the house, you follow me? The owner of the house, if I go home to my house and I have to knock on the door and ask to be let in, there will be some problems. If I go home and I knock on my door and somebody comes to the door and I have to ask for an in invitation to get into my own house, there will be some problems. Here comes Jesus, and he knocks on the door, and someone opens, and he said, Look, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears me, so there's some people in there, right? So there are some people in there, but they're not who? They're not Jesus. But there's some people in there. They knock on the door, and he says, Look, 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 look. If anyone hears me and open, so the owner of the house doesn't have a key to enter the house. He doesn't have a key to enter because he knocks politely, nicely. And he said, if anyone hears me, let him open and I'll come in. So Jesus is saying, can I enter you today? Can I enter you today? This is what I talk about going to the back of Paul's mind. We know that oftentimes we look at the Corinthian text and we say Corinth was the, one of the worst society in, in, in modern history back then where sexual immorality was a big thing and, and Paul was writing against sexual immorality and he was saying to these people, look, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? And why are you doing all these immoral, immoral things and messing up your temple? When I say get into the mind of Paul, I'm saying let's understand what Paul meant by saying temple. Uh, Paul is a Old Testament scholar. When he used words, he's only referring back to what is in Old Testament. And we're seeing the glory of God in the Old Testament when he came down. And Paul is saying, do you not know that you're the temple of the Holy Spirit? In other words, do you not know that you are that person in which the entire glory of God dwells in you. Now I want you to move your mind from the sun, wherever your imagery was, and I want you to start to understand that same glory, which is brighter than the sun, which the sun, uh, the watt of the sun is 3.85 times 10 to the 36 power. That's the brightness of the sun from a watt standpoint. Imagine God's glory is much more than that. Imagine you and Dinah become the rest of our become the house become where that glory reside get your mind there can you picture what that looks like 
that if there are a hundred or two hundred people listening to me today we are the temple with that magnificent glory therefore when we move around it is the glory of God that is moving around oh you missed it oh, forgive me you missed it thank you you missed that okay I'll come back to it since you miss it I'll give you some time to think about it and I'll come back to it in just a moment First Peter, chapter 2, verse 9. But you, who? But you are a chosen people. You are selected. Come on, keep that in mind. I want to break this down a bit. Take your time. You are a chosen people. So you're selected, right? You're selected. A royal, the word royal in Hebrew, the word royal in Hebrew means belonging to a supreme one. So the word royal in Hebrew belonging means belong to a supreme one. Let's read that over. You are set apart because you belong to a supreme one. Follow me so far. I'm going to retranslate the text. You are chosen because you belong, royal, you belong to a supreme one. The word priesthood means that you have been invested with authority. So go with me now. You are selected, you belong to a supreme being, and that supreme being have now invested you with his authority to act on his behalf. Are you still with me? So you are a chosen, selected, you are royal because there's a supreme being. This supreme being has given you authority and it's going back to this thing of a temple. So God is the one saying, look, when you, are, when you are my temple, you belong to me, you've been set apart, you've been given priestly authority, means that you've been invested with my power to take care of yourself. Keep going here. A holy nation, still in First Peter chapter two, verse nine. A holy nation, God's special people. Special means what? You're preserved. The word "special" means to be preserved. But let's back up a bit. If we are set apart, we have power from a supreme being. We've been given the authority to use the power of a supreme being. And he says we are priesthood. What are the things that a priest is supposed to do? A priest is supposed to administer care to the temple, right? So uh, the work of a priest is spiritual, right? So the, the, the priest would make sure that there are loaves in the sanctuary system. And the bread represents what? The loaves represent what? The word of God. There needs to be, there needs to be oil in uh, the lamb stand, right? The oil represents what? So in other words, if I am given this authority of God, by God, and this authority as a priest, in this state, I, am, I need to, to, to make sure that there is bread. There's loaves. In other words, the word of God needs to be in God's house. So in other words, every single day when my eyes open, because I am a priest, I must have a connection to the word of God. And I really wish there was time I could tell you about the power of the word of God. And when I say the power of the word of God, I'm not talking about how we hear it all the time. A part of the work that I've done over the last 10 years is to look at scans, brain scans, we call them fMRI scans and we look at these scans when people are either meditating on the Word of God and they're praying and the things that happen in the human brain you imagine a city that is very dark and, and it's Christmas night and the city is extremely dark and there's only one light there and everybody's waiting for this light to be plugged in and the moment the light is plugged in the entire city our community becomes lightened in other words what I'm saying is that when the Word of God is in the mind that we meditate in the word of God the brain illumines with the same brightness 
There's blood flow going to all three areas of the brain covering all 100 billion neurons that connects with over a thousand trillion connection in the human brain. And when we pray and focus on the word of God, the brain becomes like this of light. You can see blood running throughout the brain. That's why we, that's the awesome responsibility that we have. God says, I've invested you with the power to make your brain what it ought to be, to make your life what it ought to be. If we neglect our priesthood, then we neglect our bodies. And Paul says, do you not know, do you not know that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit and you are not your own? You have been bought with a price. So we have been set apart by God, a special position of God. We are preserved by God. What does this really mean to us that God desired to dwell in me? God desired to live in me more than anything else in the universe, more than any miracle. The greatest miracle of human history is that God desired to be inside of me. As messed up as I am, God desired to live in me. That's a miracle within itself. But sometimes I put idols in there. Sometimes I do things that I ought not to do. And God is not saying I condemn you for it. God is asking a simple question. Do you not know? That's all he's asking. Do you not know who you are? Do you not know who you are? In my work, I work with people who struggle with identity crisis. They struggle with people to understand their purpose. If we allow and embrace this glory of God in us, this beauty of God, if we just, as I said, imagine it, if we allow this glory of God in us, then we will understand our true identity. Who are you? What have you done? I like this text. I will go back to a few of these. Second Corinthians chapter 3, verse 15 to 18. This is sweet. Yes, even today, when they read Moses, Moses' writings, their hearts are covered with that veil. And they do not understand. But whenever someone turns to the Lord, whenever someone does what? Whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is what? Okay. Let's pause there for a moment. You remember, I stated earlier, that when Moses came from the presence of God, the people could not do what? They could not look at Moses. The text says, when someone turns to the Lord... The veil is taken away. You see, let's, let's keep going. For the Lord is the Spirit, and whoever the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? There's freedom. We come back to that. So all of us who have had that veil, still not getting it, right? It blows my mind. Have that veil removed can see and do what? If you're in the text, I like it. Go home with it. Be Bereans. Go study the text yourself. Verse 18. So all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect what? Reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like Him as we change into His glorious image. I want to break this down. Go back where I started Genesis. Adam and Eve are now created in the image of God. They are covered with the glory of God. What is it that God wants to restore? God wants to restore in Hebrew the imago dehe, His image in them. Uh, so here Paul is saying, when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the veil is taken away and you can bask, you can look, you can be in that glory, in the presence of God. What does this mean for me? It means that I am a temple. I am in the glory of God. So when my husband 
or my wife offends me because I walk with the glory of God. I am the church in my home because I'm there. I have to respond the way how the glory of God would want me to respond. You want another way? When someone bad drives me on the highway or the street and I want to give them a piece of my mind, I need to remember that I am the glory of God walking around. Whenever my husband and my wife say something that offends me and I want to give them a piece of my mind, I ought to remember that I represent the glory of God. His glory does not move in and out. It is always there. It's constant. He says, I am the Lord your God and I change not. I am always there. I will never leave you nor forsake you. I am always with you. So God's glory does not take vacation. His presence does not take a moment away. We are always in his presence. He lives. The Bible says in, 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 Psalm, in Acts chapter 17 verse 24. In him we live and move and have our very existence. Can you imagine if we are to really be the temple of the Holy Spirit? I'm not talking about exercising and eating right. I'm not talking about the new start, powerful stuff. I'm not talking about all those good stuff. I'm talking about if we as God's people should truly be the temple of God. What that would mean. It means that veil, if you couldn't look at Moses' face, you think of the sun, the brightness of the sun. A psychophysicist in 1834, Fechner, wanted to study stimulation. And he decided that one of the, 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 the crazy things he would do, he would spend time looking at the sun. And within a few moments, Fechner became blind. Yes, it helped us to understand psychophysics and understand sensation as a scientist. But he looked at the sun and he, I imagine God's glory is much, you just can imagine it, that God's glory is much more brighter than that. And picture in your homes, at work, wherever you are, if you are that glory, what's going to happen? God's ultimate plan for humanity is to restore his image in them. That's his ultimate plan. Everything else is secondary to that. Everything else is secondary. God's ultimate plan is to see powerful people walking around. If we call ourselves Christian and we desire to be Christian, God is saying you have not been there yet. My myopic mind cannot perceive what God has in store for me. But God has stated that you have it. That's the thing about this text. God is not asking a question in terms of a doubtful question. The question is, do you not know? Do you not know who you are? Who your true identity is? Psalm. Chapter 4, verse 8. What is man that thou art mindful of him? The son of man that thou visitest him. You have created him a little lower than Elohim. Elohim is the Hebrew word for God. There's a lot of debate around the text. Who would take it for hell him being God? God is saying, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you visited him, visited him? Do you not know that I've crowned him, I'm giving, I've created him a little lower than myself? Who am I? Picture this. If we take the text, Elo, uh, the word Elohim to mean God, God have created you a little lower than myself. Who am I? What's my identity? God said, I've created you, Lord. That's what the Bible says. We have whose image? The image of God. God is calling us into something deeper. 
than we have been. I believe with all my heart that Jesus is coming back soon. And I'm going to be controversial at this point in time. I tell people what I'm doing. He's not coming back for people who keep the Sabbath perfectly. He's not coming back for people who know the state of the dead theology thoroughly. He's not coming back for people who are vegans. He's not coming back for people who have a thorough understanding of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and the Trinity. He's not coming back for a, a people who understand everything about the Santora system and stewardship. He's not coming back for people who understand the theory of the second, his second coming. He's coming back for people who open themselves to reflect his image. His only desire, and don't get me wrong, when you have the image of God, those things will come into place. Don't, 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 don't miss me. I'm just saying he's not coming up for people who are perfect in those things. He's not coming up for people who are perfect in understanding the 28 fundament, fundamental beliefs. I spent years studying them. I know them. I've defended them. But he's not coming back for the knowledge you have based on those things. He's not coming back with people who know this thing from Genesis to Revelation. You can quote the text and you can do juxtaposition with text and all of that. He's coming back for a set of people in which his glory and his image is perfectly replicated. That's who he's coming back for. And the Bible tells us that all we need to do and this is going to sound so simplistic, and I have friends who get into it all the time. So simple. I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears me, let him open his heart and let me in. You can be a Christian for 50 years and Jesus has never lived in your heart. You can be a pastor and Jesus has never lived in your heart. Church attendance, perfect church attendance record, does not mean Jesus lives in our hearts. Saints of God, saints of God. God is calling us to bask and to enjoy his glory. See, Moses spent some time with God. There's a little old lady who lived in the 1900s. And she made this comment just at the end of her life. She said, a thoughtful hour a day, meditating, and the last scenes of Gethsemane will do good for God's people. She said, a thoughtful hour each day. I know our lives are busy. I know we're busy people. I know we've got to make hens meet. I know that. But God desire you more than anything else. Do you desire him? If it is your desire to say, God... I cannot comprehend your glory. I cannot understand your glory. I can't even perceive your glory. But I know I've seen that others have experienced this glory. And God, I desire to be there. I desire to know Jesus who will take away the veil. So I can experience God's glory. If that is your desire, just stand with me. If you're like God... I'm tired, I'm sick and I'm tired of mere Christianity. I'm sick and I'm tired of mere church going. I'm sick and I'm tired 
have wandered around my desert for so long. I need a change. God sees all those who are standing. Just bow your heads with me. Eternal righteous Father. Like Moses. We desire you. Father, we really don't know what your glory is. We really can't understand it. But Lord, we know who you are. And that which we don't understand, you will reveal in us. Father, like Paul said, give us the desire to surrender our hearts to you. Father, please, please, Lord, give us, give us, Lord, the strength to open our hearts. Give us the strength, Lord, to open our hearts to you so you can come in and suck. Father, take your people today and do what needs to be done. Because you are the only one who can do a perfect work. Help us, Lord, to surrender ourselves to you so you can do the transformation. So when you burst the eastern skies, you will say to us, well done, good and faithful servants. Come enter into my joy. Lord, keep us faithful and keep us strong in your power and your grace until you come. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen, Lord. My desire is for you. And we are praying, O oh God, that we will so order our life and make ourselves available so that God can live in and through us and so that we can reflect the glory of God to the world. Thank you very much, Pastor Duki, for sharing with us this morning. We want to stand and make use of the hymn 435. When all my labors and trials are whole, and I am safe on that beautiful shore, just to be near the dear Lord I adore, will through the ages be glory for me. 435. Will you stand, please? When all my labors and trials are o'er, and I am safe on that beautiful shore, just to be near the dear Lord I adore. Will through the ages be glory for Will through the ages be glory for me. Oh, that will be glory for me. Grace. 
Father in heaven. Carpool back here by 3 3 30, and we all remove the seaport joint meeting will be there with all three churches. Dismiss us, Lord, with blessings we. Sweet- 